underwriting deals is such a major pain point for people. Most don't want to do it, and the people that are good at it are few and far between. That is why after six years of being in the industry and buying over 1,200 apartments, using my best-selling multifamily deal analyzer, I created Real Estate Lab, a full suite acquisition software for multifamily investors. We have built a product that helps investors automate their acquisitions and close more deals all in a cloud-based platform. You can go to realestatelab.com and sign up today using the promo code TAG2 for 10% off your first 12 months. This is David Tupin. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Apartment Gurus, where twice a week, host Tate Seymour brings you deep dive interviews with the wisest gurus in the apartment investing industry. These experts are sure to create game-changing value and inspiration designed to catapult your business to the next level. Be sure to reach out to Tate at www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. And now, here is Tate Seymour and the Apartment Gurus. Welcome, everybody, back. Another episode of the Apartment Gurus coming at you and i feel like we've delivered today on the name the apartment gurus because we have a true guru in the space aren't you been at it for a long time what 40 plus years 40 plus years in the real estate industry yes yeah yeah so you know somebody we don't get to talk to somebody with this kind of experience very often uh where you've been in 40 plus years of of real estate and specifically now in multifamily. Uh, And so I'm really excited to have Mr. Arn Senadella on the show out of Greenville, South Carolina, weighing in at, I'm just kidding. Um, So no, really excited to have you on the show, Arn. Thank you so much for being with me. Yeah, Tate, uh, glad to be here. Appreciate the opportunity and hopefully we can help uh, work together, help people on their investing journey and provide some info, you know, useful information that can help them get where they want to be. Love it. Love it. Love it. Cool. Um, you were sharing with me offline. Do you mind, do you mind sharing with the listeners, uh, how young you are? Well, I turned 68 two days ago. So, uh, <laughs> well, happy birthday. Well, thank you. So yep. 68, but, uh, Jazzed about what I'm doing. Looking forward to the future, and uh, I love it. Uh, it's an exciting time for me, and we'll get into the story a little bit. But yeah, um, yeah, uh, full speed ahead. I love it. I love that you are past, uh, you know, a t- kind of a typical retirement age. But it seems like you are at, every bit is on fire and excited about uh, work and your mission and your purpose in life as you've ever been. Uh, yes. And, uh, part of that is, uh, you know, transitioning from basically a single family career to multifamily. Uh, I had done the, uh, the single family investing for decades and, uh, recently switched to multifamily and it's residential real estate, it's investing, it's real estate, but it's a yep. whole different kind of asset and there's more to learn. There's differences. And so, yep making a change of pace kind of gives you a little shot in the arm. And as you're learning, you're growing, it's exciting to do something new. Yeah. And uh, so for me, it came at a, a, a good time in my life. And, uh, you know, I'm excited. I started to make this change. When did you uh, make uh, start to make the transition to multi? Uh, I would say right about the time COVID hit. Yeah. So a young investor buddy of mine here in Greenville um, who started syndicating maybe five or six years ago called me in March of 2020. And he said, hey, Arn, what do you think is going to happen with rent collections with COVID hitting? And this was March of 2020, which yeah. was about the time the United States and the whole world kind of understood COVID's a deal and it's something we got to deal with. And I said to Mario, well, talk to me April 5th and I'll let you know, meaning, you know, let me see if my April rents come in. And I didn't have any problem with rent collection, but at the end of the conversation, he turned me on to a podcast and 
I was kind of immediately hooked on the multifamily. Light bulb went off in my head. And during COVID, uh, I would spend hours every day listening to various podcasts. And that's really how I got my first taste and education about specifically the multifamily business, even though I'd been in real estate a long time. And yes, there's similarities, the residential construction, it's tenants, the heaters, the hot water heaters, they're all the same, but certainly multifamily does have its differences. And it was exciting kind of learning about that. Yeah. 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 Um, I got to ask you, what podcast was that, that first one that you listened to? Uh, if it's okay to say, it was actually Neil Bawa. Neil is one of our best friends at, at the Apartment Gurus. We love Mr. Neil Bawa and uh, he's, he's been a, a generous uh, guest now twice on the show. I believe maybe three times on the show. Um, and if, if you want to get excited about multifamily from somebody that really knows his stuff, go check out Neil Bawa. I'll, I'll just, I'll finish the shout out for you, Aaron, like uh, multifamily, you Dot com I believe it's it's mul- just Google multifamily you all one word with the letter U at the end and you'll find his stuff. He's got a wealth of resources online, uh, free resources, uh, webinars mostly or it's mostly webinar format. And he's just fascinating. He makes the whole thing fun. He makes it exciting. He's he, he's wired uh, as an optimist in my opinion. Um, and not that that makes him unrealistic. In fact, I think it makes him very effective and powerful at what he does. And so, um, so no, I'm, I'm glad you're willing to share that with us. He's, he's, he's quite a guy. Yeah. And you know, the other connection is, is basically I spent most of my life in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Our real estate office was in Menlo park in Palo Alto. I lived in San Carlos. So, uh, uh, I grew up in Santa Clara County before there was a Silicon Valley. And wow. so Neil's connection to the Bay Area and kind of tech certainly resonated with me. And um, yeah, so that that was kind of the start. And just to finish up the, the pitch, uh, back then, at least, he had like kind of a two week intensive boot camp. Right. Which I found really good. And the nice thing about it is there's no additional coaching or mentoring program he's trying to sell. It's just straight content. And uh, I learned so much of that in those two week sessions. So I, I, I ask people to check into that, too. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Shout out. There you go, Neil. If, if, <laughs> if you ever listen to this, huge yeah. shout out to you. Um, no, Neil was actually very influential in our picking of our, one of our markets that we currently own product, uh, projects and property inside of, which is Columbus, Ohio. Um, I don't know if he used Columbus with you guys, uh, when, when he it, does the whole market analysis breakdown. Um, he certainly did. He yeah. certainly did. Yeah. Yeah. And Columbus is a unique market because it has the components of both a, a cash flow market and a growth market, like a appreciation market. And that's kind of rare to find that in, uh, in the big, you know, the bigger either uh, primary or secondary markets in this country. Um, usually it's one or the other, and you got to either play the game one way or the other way, depending on what kind of market you're in. So we love uh, everything about the market of Columbus, Ohio. And, um, it's really, we focus there in Oklahoma city, uh, and between the, the two of us and everybody that's listening, Columbus is my favorite between the two, no offense, Oklahoma city. We love you too. Uh, and we, and we love our residents there. We love our, pro- man, we have the best property manager in, in Oklahoma city and Tulsa. Um, that that's just fantastic. Shout out to Amy Boers at, uh, at uh, oh, I was going to say Fillmore, Winfield Property Management. Um, so yeah, Winfield with Amy Boers, great property manager. But if you're in Tulsa or OKC, anyway, enough of the shout outs here. <laughs> Arn, um, so can you kind of run us real quick through your background uh, before multifamily and real estate and kind of what you did for, uh, for all those years? Sure. So uh was a pretty typical 
middle class, middle income American kid, you know, was taught to work hard at school, do well in school, go to college. I ended up going all the way through grad school, mm. uh, got a master's degree in chemistry from the University of Michigan. So I'll Good give a you. shout out to them. Wolverines. And uh, and then uh, I called my dad and I said, hey, I think I'm being burnt out on the academics. Want to come back to the Bay Area? And he said, well, come on out get your license and I'll put you to work. So he had a small residential brokerage in Menlo Park, California. And March, 1978, I got my license. And for 30, 35 years, I sold residential real estate on the San Francisco Peninsula. Yeah, My dad was very much an old school, single family investor. So he'd accumulate houses. And he kind of said to me, hey, the brokerage is great to produce the income, but to create financial security and wealth, you really need to invest, right? Yeah. So the brokerage can be the income source, generate the capital. You then have to put the capital to work to really kind of create wealth. And so I followed in his footsteps and started being buying single family homes, both in the Bay Area and also down in the Austin, Texas area. And of course, way back 1980, 1990, the houses in the Bay Area weren't quite as expensive as they are today. So you could right. actually buy some as rentals. So I pretty much did that, build a single family rental portfolio. And then um, Laura, my life partner, is lifetime Bay Area resident, and I were kind of ready to go to a new adventure. Bay Area is great, but we'd been there, done that, and wanted something different. So we packed up and moved clear across country to Greenville, South Carolina, which we love. I think our friends were thinking we're a little crazy moving to South Carolina and maybe wonder, do they even have internet here? But they, <laughs> they, they do have internet, trust me, you know. Uh, and in any case, uh, continue to invest here did a lot of flips and then transition into multifamily. Um, I still have a few single family properties, a few two to four unit properties, but most of my portfolio now ranges from 12 to 281 units, either joint ventures or syndications. Um, have a lot of investors from Silicon Valley, but I also have a lot of local investors. And for me, nothing better than getting together with the group of folks, have a beer, talk about real estate and try to locate some good opportunities and work together to kind of buy them and manage them. So it's kind of a social thing for me too. And that and and that's really one of the things I enjoy about multifamily, single family investing. You can almost do it as a one man band, mm -hmm. but yep. you know the multifamily. It is a team aspect, absolutely. And I really enjoy. And of course, you have to find the right partners, and that's not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you find the right partner. Uh, or partners. And generally, I kind of find maybe two, three, four person teams is ideal. You don't need more, mm -hmm. but that kind of level is the right interaction, in my opinion. And so that's a part of it that I really do enjoy. I'm fortunate enough to have a great partner who also lives here in Greenville, who takes care of all the stuff I don't want to take care of all the day-to-day nitty-gritty of owning properties and fixing them and dealing with tenants. I like chasing them down. I like finding them. I like trying to put together the team to buy them, like raising the capital. Getting You're a deal down. junkie. I'm a deal junkie. I'm an adrenaline junkie. Yeah. And uh, my buddy, Brian, and it's funny, um, we were talking earlier, how do people get into this? So Brian was primarily a residential property manager, has maybe 400 houses here in Greenville. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had slowly turned over my rental portfolio to him. And for about two years, I was after him. Hey, Brian, come on, let's go together and do some multifamily deals. Um, I recognized that I was not the best property manager or operator, right? right? 
Right. That just it isn't who I am. Okay. And so I was held back because there was a missing piece right. that I needed before I could legitimately go to people and ask them to entrust their money with me. And so when I finally got Brian on board, that little checkbox was done. And I now knew I had a partner who could run these deals professionally and I didn't have to worry about it. And once we formed that partnership, things really took off. And I imagine your story is similar. Well, it somewhat similar, but I think what the important you know takeaway here is you recognized two things. You recognized number one, what you're good at. That that's first. You're you're good at deals. You're good at finding deals. You're good at negotiating deals. You're good at raising capital. You're good at getting the deal to the finish line. And you recognize that that's your thing. And your thing is not managing properties uh, or even asset managing properties, right? Like you want to be out front driving the ship on the next deal or, uh, you know, whatever that is involving at the time, due diligence, that sort of thing. And uh, so you needed a partner. And that's, like you said, really well uh, spoken is this is very much a team effort. It's a team sport. And uh, if if you're not of the mentality that you want to be working with uh, a partner or a couple partners or, four, you know, three, four partners on a deal, it's probably not a good space for you because you're not, uh, nobody that I know has everything that it takes to get a deal done and uh, and not just get a deal done, but manage a property after acquisition. Like that is a big it's not, it's not just a big deal. It's the big deal because the implementation of your business plan after you buy the property is everything. It's a hundred percent where the rubber meets the road. You know, if you think about a car, no part of the car touches the ground except for the tires. And that's so true. Once you own a property, like it's your business plan is everything. And the, and the successful, successful implementation of it is make it or break it. So, you know, you were so smart, Arn, in my opinion, to to recognize your uh, the gap, right? Like the gap in in the business that you had um, that you needed to fill, and then to go out and fill it with somebody somebody good. And and you know, you've got a few, you know, few, more than just a couple of decades of experience <laughs> in this business. So I'm sure you're a pretty good judge of character by now, and I'm sure you picked a great partner. Uh I did. And um, to piggyback on your point about how at the end of the day, it's that professional operation of that asset, that million dollar business being the key. Yeah. Uh, what I talk to my investors about is, hey, look, we don't know what the future is going to be like, right? Right. We don't know what interest rates are going to be like. We don't know what cap rates are going to be like. We don't know what the world, national or local economy is going to be like. Right. We put together performers, make projections. But all of those factors are outside our control. The only thing we can control after acquisition is do we professionally operate that property maximizing yeah. the net income for our investors. And the way I look at it, the way I can sleep at night is if I know I did a professional proper job in the operation, I've met my fiduciary duty to my investors, right? I can't control what the Federal Reserve's going to do, right. but I can run that property. So, um, we often hear in this space, look at the operator, look at the sponsor first, then maybe yep. the market and then the deal last. So I think you're exactly right. It's that operation. And and frankly, what I would say is, given the way the multifamily market has been the last couple of years, people who were not good operators still made out okay. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I believe that's going to change, change a little bit. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it just, just the thought that operation is really key. It's not the sexy part of the deal, 
But at the end of the day, if you operate it well, have a long-term perspective, and go into it with ample cash reserves, right. you're going to be able to ride out a year or two of headwinds. Because in my experience over 40 years, generally, I see real estate markets go up five, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. Then maybe you have a one or two year of flat to slight decline. And as long as you can operate through that, and there's no reason you shouldn't be able to, you're when you come out the back end, it's another five or six years up. Of so yeah. As, yeah. as long as you're positioned to ride out any potential headwinds, you're going to end up winning. So I think it's important to think about that in these times where maybe people have concerns. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I completely agree with you on all those points. Um, at Greenlight, we are focused on good deals that cash flow, right? And that are more than paying the debt service, the expenses, and our preferred equity payments to our investors. Um, those are the deals that we're going for. We're putting them on long-term fixed rate debt. And we're we're planning on holding them for at least five years. So we feel like we're positioning ourselves in these deals to, uh, you know, to ultimately to ride through whatever uh, downturn recession that happens might, might happen. And, um, and that's what you, what, what you just alluded to Arn, is, is the ability to ride through um downturns in real estate as long as you're set up well and that's so key like you got to you got to get a, a deal that's solid that pencils well that's financed well and that's and then you like you guys have so well addressed is managed well that is like all those things if one of those is out of place you're hosed like you're you know you're you're not you're not in a good in a good spot um so let me ask you how many units do you guys currently own in Greenville? Do you know? In Greenville, uh, I would say it's going to be close to 400. Okay. And then you still, you still own in California and Austin as well? Uh, no, I do not own anything in California. Okay. And uh, I got out of Austin uh, four or five years ago. Still have gone. Austin, of course, has gone crazy. But I invested the money here. And the Greenville market's been really strong. I kind of enjoy it. You know, being an investor, it's almost like playing real life Monopoly, you sure. know. And so it, it, it there's a certain fun to to do that. Uh, so nothing in California, nothing in Texas. Um, I have invested as an LP, maybe in six or seven deals. Okay. And typically I kind of focus Southwest or maybe mountain West, sorry, Southeast or mountain West. And um, to, to, to help some of your listeners uh, as multifamily came on my radar, I started investing as an LP. So I probably made four or five LP investments. And on one of my calls with the lead operator on a particular deal, I said to the guy, um, hey, I've been in real estate a long time. I can raise capital for real estate. I'd like to move into the active space. So if down the road you have a need for somebody to raise some capital, please keep me in mind. And sure enough, a month later, he calls me and goes, hey, we got a deal. This is what we need you to do. And I said, right on. And um, so it was mm. kind of my activities as an LP right. put me in contact with potential GPs. And as you know, for listeners, there's typically two ways to get in this business, raise capital or find deals. Find a deal, and find so, a dollar, yeah. Right. And so that is, so it was interesting because when I first got into it, I thought I just want to raise capital. I'm 66, 67, 68. And, you know, I don't want to be involved in the day to day. But actually, as I got into it, it became more clear to me that I really do enjoy having control of the deal and kind of spearheading the effort. So, 
I now pretty much do not raise capital for any other operators. My focus is on finding my deals and raising capital for them. So it's an interesting transition because when yeah. I started in it, that wasn't the game plan, but it was just getting a little bit of experience then kind of showed me what I really enjoyed doing. And I transitioned. You know, this point is so important for listeners to get. And I, you know, I, I have given a few st- talks at, uh, our local real estate investor association groups here in Utah. We have a couple of them. And, uh, typically what I speak on is something along the lines of how to get into multifamily investing and how to become a owner operator. This particular lane, this particular path, uh, from point A to point B, in my opinion, is a very, very solid one that is worthy of your consideration. You can invest in a deal, uh, in in somebody else's deal, sometimes for as little as twenty five thousand. Most of the time, you're looking at a fifty thousand dollar minimum, but um, a lot of times too, even if you're looking at a fifty thousand dollar minimum, quite frankly, if you go to a group and say, you know what, I'd really love to invest with you guys, but I've only got twenty five. Nine times out of ten, they're probably going to say, bring it. Um, so that said. The other thing you can do is, is well, you want to be interviewing your operators, your owner operators anyway. Uh, like Arn said, like he was talking to his uh, this sponsor that was going to do this this deal or did this deal with him, and eventually ended up bringing him a deal that he could be on the general partnership for as as a capital raiser. But, um, you know, this is uh, when you're when you're interviewing these. Uh, these operators, these sponsors, my suggestion would be saying something along the lines of, you know what, I'll be totally transparent with you. I really want to become an owner operator or a sponsor myself. And I'd love to even work with you in the future on future deals. Um, How would you feel about kind of treating me almost like a general partner here and, uh, and helping me learn the business, right? Dude, if somebody came to me like that and said, I want to learn the business from you and I might partner with you in the future. I'd be all over that opportunity and I would include them in, on meetings, on Zoom meetings and calls. I would include them in important email chains that they should be privy to. And uh and you know, so at least person, you know, personally speaking with Greenlight and my guess is Arn you'd probably welcome a similar opportunity. Um, you know, Consider listeners, consider this opportunity to invest as a limited partner as a very, very good way of getting into this business. Sounds like you feel the same way, Arn. Uh, yes. And we accept plenty of $25,000 investments. Like in my mind, we believe in real estate and we know what it can do. Most right. p- people believe in real estate, but either they don't have the time or the knowledge to kind of tackle it themselves, right? They're yeah. afraid they don't know. So we're offering an opportunity for people to invest in real estate. And I would submit in a crazy world like this, w- where is better to put your money than in real estate, right? In actual Absolutely. buildings, in growth markets that you know people are are moving, it's as close to a sure thing as you can get. Yeah. Um, so I actually enjoy being able to be the first sponsor somebody invests with. Cool. They've never done it before. And what I also tell people is if you have a certain nest egg of investable cash, 100,000, whatever it happens to be, everybody's different. You don't have to go 100,000 all in on your first deal. That's right. What I would recommend is you try a little here, try a little here, try a little here, spread it around a little bit, give you exposure to several different operators, and you'll be able to tell which ones you feel really good about and which ones maybe you have concerns about. Um, the other thing I enjoy, and you kind of alluded to it, is... Um, I have some local younger folks who want to get into multifamily investing and I'm trying to help them and I'm trying to kind of find them 
you know, a, a, a new active person probably can't jump into a $50 million deal, even as a co-GP, right? I think the deal has to be a little smaller. Yeah. Um, and so um, I have two or three younger folks that are happy to go on property tours with me. They're proper, they're, they're happy to do some market research, not for the expectation of compensation, but rather just to kind of get in the game and see how it's done. So I think that's another way people can do it is provide some value, you'll yeah. get educated, start building that relationship. And then, hey, when you find a deal, what I would recommend is bring somebody in a little more experience just to help you through. And as we talk about the, what's it called? The law of the first deal. That's right. One, your education knowledge level goes up about a thousand percent on your first deal. Absolutely. And then the other thing is once you get that first deal, now, at least for me, you have some self-confidence. You can do it. Right. That's right. The the brokers in the area now know you can do it. That's right. And once you get the brokers sending you deals, now you're over the hump and yeah. it's going to flow. So I would encourage people, find a way to get involved. Don't worry so much about compensation day one. That's right. Figure your compensation is the education, the knowledge, and the relationships you build. And you know, most people want to share and they want to help others. And for me, it's just kind of if someone's willing to put in the effort, I'm willing to provide the guidance because I know this person's got what it takes and is going to be willing to do the work to make it happen. Right. It, it makes a difference. It's not going to be handed to them. If they're willing to do the work, you give them the help and you give them the guidance. I, my my head's been on a swivel for like five minutes now, just <laughs> nodding up and down. <laughs> um, I I am just in absolute full alignment with everything you said, Arn, and um, I couldn't agree more. And and I honestly, I I really do care about people that want to get into this business being successful. Like that's really important to me. And I I'm you know starting to offer some coaching. Um, uh, a coaching program. I have a, a coach, new coaching program that's coming out. Um, and it's all about this. Like, I love this coaching program. Check it out, Arn. It's a hundred percent how it's basically a hundred percent getting your first deal as an owner operator, right? Or if you've already gotten your first deal, scaling up, like getting your first 150 unit deal. And I love that because it's got like, a very specific singular focus. And if you think about most coaching programs, like life coaching or business coaching or whatever it is, it's kind of like, you, it's pretty nebulous. You kind of start with like, you know, I want to get in better shape and I want, I want a better love life and I want my business to 10 X. And, and so you have all these things that you're kind of talking about and, and uh, focusing on kind of little scattered areas of your life right and 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 yes it's all very important it's all and it's because it's holistic you know you're a whole human being and every part of your life affects every other part of your life however i love just having this focus on let's go get deals done uh kind of thing and i'm all in man like anything i can do uh to to help people um whether it's coaching or the podcast or anything else is like uh, you know, I'm all in on it. I love, I love seeing people succeed. Um, and it sounds like you do too. I, I, I can absolutely tell that you do too. And you, you're able to acknowledge people whose heart is in the right place and who's, uh, who's got their head on straight and is really ready to go after it and go get it. And, uh, and then you're, you welcome them into your, into your circle, so to speak, and help them out. I think that's fantastic. It, it, it just, it, it it just mushrooms, blossoms and grow. Uh, you know, my father was my first mentor and he taught me a lot. But in the multifamily space, uh, I've had two, two primary mentors. And the truth is, uh, I probably couldn't have done it without them. Yeah. And I remember on my first deal, uh, I kind of 
something came up during due diligence and I almost was ready to lose my mind and walk mm -hmm. away. And then my mentor said, well, hold on a second here. And we worked through it. And I'm sure glad I stuck with it. And we bought that property. It's doing great. And so when you feel you have somebody in your corner who's been there, done that, it just makes things so much easier and better. Uh, so I totally yeah. support mentoring. And what I would say is there are a lot of mentors out there. And again, just as looking for a deal sponsor or, you know, as an LP looking for somebody to invest in, if you're looking for a mentor, again, kind of have to have a heart to heart conversation and is, are you guys aligned on values? Do you kind of yeah. talk the same language? Um, for me and for me, if somebody's trying to sell a mentoring program standing in front of a Lamborghini, it's probably not quite my style. That isn't right. that isn't my vision, right? And so I think as a new multifamily, you want to find kind of the people that are are your folks, you know, that you you communicate well with and you feel comfortable with, and you kind of have. Uh, a symbiosis there. So find the right person that's going to most effectively help you get where you want to go. Did you do a paid mentorship at all when you were starting a multifamily? Uh, so uh, I did Neil Bawa's boot camp, yep. and then I did a paid mentorship. Uh, and I don't know if I can announce the person's name. I'm happy to. If you don't want, that's fine too. No, you're you're more than welcome to. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, I worked with uh, Reed Goosens out yep. of Los Angeles, yep. and yep. he had a great program. It was focused, as you mentioned, simply like a four-month program. Mm. It wasn't a fortune to join. It wasn't a year commitment. It wasn't, you know, and basically what it was was two hours a week on Zoom. Mm. There was me and three other mentees. There was Reed and his partner. So there were six people on a Zoom call, two hours a, a, a night for every week. Uh, they'd present information, and then we have kind of an hour of Q&A. And uh, just having that kind of face-to-face, one-on-one time was really important. Uh, Reed KP would on our first couple deals, nice. and uh, he's actually our partner on the biggest deal in Greenville that we've done. So... Uh, it was four months. It was right what I needed. And again, we've developed the relationship and the relationship has led to other business and we will partner on other deals moving forward. So uh, it was well worth it. And I, uh, I've i loved getting to know Reed and what I learned. And as I mentioned during the course of this mentorship, we actually went after our first deal and being able to access him and his knowledge and experience was really critical right Huge. at that time to, to get it across. And so the value of that is priceless, right? Absolutely. So kind of whatever you have to invest to get that, it's going to be money well spent, provided you are totally committed to making this happen, right? Because yep. ultimately it falls on you. The mentor can help, but you know, they're, they're going to lead the way, but you got to pick up your feet and do the work yourself. Yeah. And look, there's no secret that I'm a huge fan of paid coaching or paid mentorships. And here's why there's two reasons. Number one, the obvious reason is that you now have a very official formal relationship with that coach who in a sense has an obligation to you to really um, provide, show up and provide their very, very best to elevate you to where you want to get to. However, the second reason that I love paid coaching is because you, you have skin in the game as the coachee. And that is 100%. I it just got a thumbs up from Aaron. I love it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a hundred percent. It's everything. And if, you know, if you don't, if you're not willing to put skin in the game, you know, let's say, whatever it is, let's say 5,000 to $25,000, depending on the coaching program and, and whatever it ends up being, um, you know, you're going to make likely maybe six figures at least on an acquisition fee on your first deal. 
if you if you structure it well and do it right that's a fraction of you know it's a huge exponential that acquisition fee it's a huge huge roi on that mentoring you mentioned that reed really was pivotal for you and due diligence and um you know in the course of getting that property to the finish line and get it bought reed stepped up he it sounds like he provided some really key stuff in in that uh in that endeavor and again like if you hadn't had that that paid relationship with him that official uh agreement you know with him that he would step up and be that person the chances of him doing that are not because he's a bad guy but because he, do- he doesn't have the relationship in place the chances of him doing that are very small and so um i congratulate you on i love how you went about this um i you know you got the right education you got a great base from neil uh and then you you got a great mentorship with reed you invested as an lp six times did you say six yeah. or seven yeah, yeah. And you learn you learn the business uh, through investing in it as an LP, and uh, it you know you just went you kind of like t- it's kind of textbook, Arn. To be honest with you, like <laughs> the way that you you were able to um, to to progress to now owning over four hundred units just in Greenville. I mean that's that's awesome. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. I'm, I'm kind of an old school guy, and I kind of believe there's a sequential way to grow. There's a systematic way. And and there are people in this space who kind of say, go big as soon as you can. And I'm not going to argue against that philosophy. Yep. But for me, it's just not me. Yep. I Even though I had 40 years in the real estate business, the residential business, I'm still a relatively newbie in multifamily. And so for me, I needed to prove it to myself on smaller deals. Uh, We probably have another mutual friend, Omar Khan, who's a cool guy in this space too. And I heard him once say, the key is to live to fight another day. Mm. Meaning you're going to do a deal and maybe everything's not going to go just right. And you're going to learn some lessons and maybe there'll be a little pain But as long as you're not mortally wounded and your investors aren't mortally wounded, you can can kind of continue on. And I think that's the other point. Uh, Often I find, uh, and I don't want to pick on engineers because they're great and, you know, the numbers are important and all of that. Um, But the answer isn't in all of the num the 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 answer isn't one hundred percent in the numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a science and there's an art an to art, investing, yeah. and you only learn that art by getting in the game. So, yeah, and a lot of times there's fear and uncertainty over something new, and you want it to be perfect, and you want to try to analyze everything, and you want to try to do it, but. Murphy's law happens, SHIT happens in life. And so I would encourage people to prudently get in the game, buy their first property. And even if it doesn't go perfect, you're going to be so much better for the next one. Um, And just understand a few little mistakes along the way are fine. And just look at them as learning opportunities And um, in the five or six lead deals I've done, I'm learning all the time that my growth point now is uh, the other hole we've discovered in the team is we're not great financial and accounting people. Okay, Okay. we're real estate guys. And so we've been able to do the financial and accounting. Our our investors had their K-1s middle of February, okay, which I'll give myself a pat on the back because usually you're waiting till June. Um, But I think the next team member might be somebody with greater financial and accounting background to kind of handle that for us. So it wasn't something that we knew we needed when we got our first deal or our second deal, but it's now becoming apparent that's a little area of weakness that we need to do something on. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, glad we did it. Glad we now see where the hole is and and we'll figure it out. Yeah, that's cool. Kind of a CFO opportunity there. Yeah. Yes, just somebody who 
is used to doing that, understands what a balance sheet is, and just can keep all the numbers. Again, it's not Brian's strength. It's not my strength. So not uh, my strength that, either. I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, uh, just to start to round things out here a little bit. Uh, so I want to ask you, you know, you, I, I, I always look for that originating moment in your career where the light bulb will you use the word you use this exact analogy the light bulb goes off on the multifamily space because we all have it at some point we all have this moment where we go geez this looks awesome why haven't i done this before why haven't i noticed this before like i'm all in on this this is super cool a lot of times it's a podcast a lot of times it's a book an audio book uh, or, um, you know, a speaker, a conference, an event that for me, it was that it was, a it was a RIA meeting, real estate investor association meeting here in Utah. Shout out to my buddy, Adam Adams, who came and gave a great talk on how to get into, uh, apartment investing and, uh, has since become a, just a dear friend of mine, um, which I feel very, very lucky about. Um, but for you, it was the Neil Bawa podcast. So, I, I I'm interested in uh do you still listen to podcasts? Do you do you listen to audiobooks? Like what's your digital um mentorship space like? I do still listen to podcasts, but on occasion I find some of the material repetitive. So, you know, I've kind of soaked a lot of it in. So I don't do as much of it now as I used to. Yeah. Um so for me. It's actually being out there in the real world, doing these deals and learning. So I would say my major source of education has shifted from podcasts to being actual in the middle of the deals um, and going to conferences, which, uh, of course, when I got in, there was COVID and most of the conferences were set were shut down except for online and yeah. online's great but the truth is belly to belly face to face it's much better so yeah. i will be in salt lake next year at a certain well known conference best ever conference baby yeah yeah, yeah. so out. I, I went to the one in denver yep uh this year um, I was there and, yep. and, and bumped into Chelsea for the first time face to face while she was there. Perfect. And so, uh, the conferences, the material is good, but really it's about maybe meeting people, you know, over zoom, right. For two years, we had zoom friends and then the ability to actually meet them face to face. It just cements that relationship and really sets the stage to some great partnerships. So that's kind of more where I'm at now than kind of the the the, the basics of the business. So that that's kind of where I'm at. Cool, I like it. Yeah. Um, and uh, any books that have been instrumental for you along the way? Well, you know, Joe Farrell's best ever syndication book is a great one. It's all kind of in there. So I would say that that's a good one. And, um, you know, I keep up with a lot of the publications. I'm on social media. People post good content. I read those articles and so forth. So that's kind of where I stay up to date on the on the business. OK, yeah. What's, and then last question for you. What's the future look like for you, Arne? Uh, the future looks like uh, hopefully I'll be doing maybe larger deals. Um, my goal, I'm 68. Things are good. Uh, I'm financially secure. Uh, I do this because I enjoy it. I do this because I like to help other people enjoy the benefits of real estate like I've experienced for 40 years. I enjoy the relationships. So for me, the dream isn't to build a big syndication company. I think for me, the dream is to get better at what I do, do maybe three or four deals a year, and yeah. I'm a happy camper. Uh, the other thing for me is uh, I don't like flying. COVID's made it even worse, but in any case, 
So I'm pretty well set. I want to stick in the Carolinas, kind of where I live, where I can hop in a car. And and that's just perfect for me. I'm not going to be flying to Phoenix to look at a deal. Uh, won't be flying up to, to Salt Lake City to look at a deal. So I kind of have this little narrow geographic focus. Fortunately, I'm blessed. It's a great market. It sure is. And, yeah. and, and developing it. So that's kind of it. Sharpen my game. Uh, do larger deals, uh, but no big dreams to build any big syndication company, develop relationships with 50, 75 good investors and take care of them and partner with other people to do deals. Love it. I love it. Dude, this has been great. You provide a really awesome uh, example and you just provide a a great uh, model to, uh, to kind of, emulate really and i love your entry into multifamily i think that story is is really valuable really fantastic how you did it um getting inspired by a podcast getting into a a short intensive boot camp getting into a paid mentorship and then get starting to get deals done that is that's textbook right there so in the game get in the game coach put me in put me in (laughs) put me in coach i'm ready to play absolutely yeah well, Arn, if people want to reach out to you, learn more about your opportunities and and uh, your deals, how how would they reach you? Uh, sure, I appreciate that, uh, Tate. Uh, so the name of my company is Spark Investment Group. You can find that or myself, Arn Cinadella, uh, on social media. The website is investwithspark.com, and my cell is 650-575-6114. So. I'm easy to find and love talking real estate, as you can tell, as Tate loves to talk real estate, too. So happy to help any way I can. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you from my listeners as well. So, Arn, thanks a ton. This has been great. Let's stay in touch. Yeah. Likewise. We will. Uh, Um, Appreciate you, too, man. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate you. And, And listeners, we love you. We appreciate you. So glad you join us for all these episodes. We're doing two a week now, keeping your keeping your ears full of good stuff from good gurus in the business and uh, really appreciate the the opportunity to be a contribution to you guys. So um, keep going out there and swinging big as Arn said earlier and, and uh, let's go get her done everybody. So Arn, thanks a ton listeners. Thank you. And we'll see you on the next episode. Take care, everybody. This has been The Apartment Gurus with Tate Seymour. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. To contact Tate, go to www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. He loves to hear from you and thanks you for being a valued listener. Just a reminder that you are the guru. See you on the next episode of The Apartment Gurus.